Um, so I was wondering how you balance like the environment that is very open and go anywhere and do anything with the uh, writing, which seems to be a little more linear, kind of we expect them to do this and then to do this. Like, is there, was there a lot of back and forth on the level design, like trying to direct players in certain directions? I'm, I'll jump in and then you can jump in too, I guess, yeah. Um, I'm actually trying to do less of that. Like, Jake played it through in like the way that we sort of thought would be cool for the demo. But the goal of the game with the dialogue and the way we kind of built our event system from the ground up is to just say yes to the player as much as possible. Like, you don't have to have that conversation with Delilah before you go out to um, deal with the campers. You can walk right by the campers and just not deal with them. You can just take their stereo and keep going. So the goal is to like just, uh, I'm friends with like, Greg Kasavin at Supergiant and we talk about this a lot and I just was really taken by Bastion when the first time I played it and how responsive a lot of that stuff was. And like, how did you get to the point where the game just felt like, oh yeah, it's cool to run through this environment and the game is responding to me. It's like, we just watch people play a lot. So we lay out the environments in a way that we think is design-wise very interesting and like prescribes to good level design. And then we watch each other play it and let other people play it and then just try to generate dialogue content and possibility space for things that people want to do. So um, I think the game, it's one of those games where it probably feel, it, it probably doesn't feel linear, as linear when you're playing it as it does when we're watching it in a panel environment. Does that yeah. make sense, Chris? Yeah, totally. Although I'm gonna point out one small thing, which is that we don't want to necessarily give people the impression that this is like an open world game in the vein of, Skyrim you know, a Skyrim or, or a GTA or something like that. It's definitely still, you know, this is a game with a very strong narrative focus, but we want the player to like exist in the possibility of that of that narrative, like the possibility space of that narrative um, in a way that is going to feel like they're expressing uh, intent as well as like just their own reactions to all the weird shit that's going on or the things that they do or whatever. And so, but it's not, it's not the kind of game where you're going to be like, go anywhere, do anything. Like, the, you know, it's not, we don't want to sell it as something that it's not. I think Sean framing it as a mystery story is, or just as a mystery in general is good though because it, it being a mystery, at a certain point, you're not going to be able to advance and uncover new things until you actually find the piece of the mystery that you need to find that actually gives you the information to move forward. But at the same time, we want, we want you to be able to be wrong and go places that you mm -hmm. don't have to be and, yeah. then, and do things in those places. But I think the way we're thinking about it is as long as the player knows like as long as they have a sense of what they should be doing and where they should be going, like, and they can recall that at any point reasonably clearly, it's okay for them to sort of go off book and wander around and do their own, like, make a strange stack of books off in the middle of nowhere, or what, you know, yeah. whatever you, whatever yeah. you want to do. Carry um, a book all the way out to the lake and yeah. throw it in the lake. As, I don't know, as why long as, not? But it's also fun to like make, like, have, like, give rewards for that stuff. So mm -hmm. that's we're to a point now in development where, like, Jane out, like we were saying, like outfit the. Um, the toilet with accoutrements, and you can like stock it with toilet paper and things like this. Yeah, yeah. I think like, and it's like, oh, what if you called Delilah from in there? What if you called her from in there and didn't have any toilet paper? It's like, <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> you know, yeah. so like, then I gotta go right yeah, there. Obviously, that's, that's not part of the like the, the, the mystery best. story, but yeah. responding to that player action <laughs> is toilet really, paper go? yeah, it's really important. <laughs> and just a really basic nuts and bolts design thing. Had Jake turned around before he walked into that? There's that we call it Pride Rock, that one like really nice rock by the campsite there. Had Jake turned around, there would have been a cliff and then a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> um, but that you would have used You'd like repelling another, equipment yeah. to get down to a new area. So yeah. the game would just would unlock very traditionally in a way that, you know, if you play Arkham Asylum or something like that, where it's like, oh, I have the thing to go to the new place now. Um, mm -hmm. So we are getting the game a yeah, little bit like that. Yeah. But this game got objects. way bigger when we built the first loop of it, then we were like, wow, there's like a lot of game here. So oh, yeah. we'll keep building those loops and figuring out ways to gate them in ways that's um, not dissatisfying. Yeah, we're finding the line between when you just have to gate an area because it would be narratively and design-wise impossible to just Make it not have it gated. You. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then, but also all the times that we've spent like literally hours sitting down just being like, well, what if the player does just do this anyway? How can it be cool? Like. How can it not break the game? How can it still allow the player to continue without it feeling like they're, you know, like in a kind of buggy mess? Like that is, I would say, probably recently anyway, the biggest mm -hmm. design challenge that we have to keep 
thinking of when we're planning this. Because the, the, the longer you go in a narrative game like this, like the more things can have happened before it. You know, right, like, right. Like, by the well, time they can't even, be here because at this point, this thing yeah. in the story has to happen. And then to be like, well, what if they did? Can we yeah, still exactly. make that a good like, story? What if yeah. on day one, you went over to this place that like probably most players are not going to go until day three? Well, like, you could. if they can do that, then we have to support it in a way that doesn't feel just like one way that's satisfying. Just left it in yeah. there just because. This needs to feel like mm -hmm. prime game content. It can't feel like right. like the parts of a dialogue tree that are like, I can't do that. I can't do that. That's like the yeah. last thing we want to do. That's actually like, yeah, I mean, just in terms of behind the scenes, like dumb dev things, I guess, like that kind of sort of very traditional style, like, I can't use this. Like, I can't go there. Like, we're always, always, always trying to not do that because that's not like, doesn't necessarily mean anything, right? Like, what's yeah. the play? Like, the thing we keep trying to think when we say, okay, well, what if the player does this? Is like, what is the player actually intending to express in doing that? And is there a way we can like reflect that back in a way that's funny or interesting or cool or surprising that still speaks to their intent with, you know, without just saying this is a game where you can literally do anything and like every single thing has to be built out. Like, blah. so yeah. um, that's how we've been thinking about it. Yeah. And the art kind of tries to funnel you into places that are interesting to go to. I mean, there's a very small art team, like I'm the only <laughs> right. So as much as we would like you to be able to explore every single bit, like we're gonna try to focus, like most of the love would be where interesting things are happening. You could go over there, but you know, it may not be the most interesting, and we will try to sort of funnel you to places that yeah, where the most interesting stuff is. You kind of go too, too far out of the explore. way. Explore, yeah. It kind of gets you know. boring. Yeah. And then maybe yeah. if you push through it, sometimes yeah. you find a secret the, interesting. The best yeah, thing exactly. is when it goes really exciting and detailed, and then sort of like, oh yeah, a forest, and then secret, exciting, and detailed yeah. thing. That's like, yeah. the unexpected is very much like a design philosophy yeah. for the studio, where it's like, yeah. keep subverting expectations. There are 12 hit Like a real forest, not every part of the forest is interesting, you know? They make a trail there for a reason, because there are cool stuff over there to see, you know? So we're trying to... But when you find something off the beaten right. path, that feels really exciting. That makes it even more exciting, you know, yeah, in my so opinion. We try to support that, too. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Was that a Nell's approved answer? Maybe we should uh, switch. Maybe we yeah. can do, like, yeah. one. Yeah, we can go back and forth. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the story and the mechanics seem to be incredibly well complemented to one another. And I was wondering if, during the design process, uh, you started with the story idea first and then built out the mechanics to support that or if the mechanics started and which side of that equation provided the most difficulty moving forward? I, I feel like it's kind of been an evolutionary process where we started off with a story and mechanics that are not in the details either of what we've what we're actually building at this point. I mean we sort of it, like there was there were some like way more puzzly versions of this and there were some way very different stories that were about a very different person and they've sort of pretty quickly in the first couple months stacked up to be about what they are at this point, I think. But Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's the benefit of being a small studio. We just kind of have to be reductive of like keeping like, what is this about? What is this about? Like, we, what can't we cut? Like, okay, the game is clearly about these two people and if we cut the radio, we lose one of them. So, you know, you just kind of keep doing that. Um, but no, the game is definitely didn't start like this. It was just, I mean, so Jake used to be my roommate. Um, for a while, I guess, and I think I just like I was in, like really liked the imagery of the of Fire Lookout Tower, and there was one near my home in Wyoming growing up, or nearish. So I just always it had been in the back of my mind. I thought it was a cool place to like set a story, and then we started working on it, and yeah, it's very iterative. But there was never like this is the vision. And that never really happens. The vision is now like the game, <laughs> you know, it kind of keeps, like... I mean, like, like yeah. there was, like, a version early on where you were maybe being stalked by a bear. So, like, the thing is, like... <laughs> <laughs> that was a bad version. Yeah, wasn't I mean, it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was like, we over pizza with Will, like, yeah. like, like way that. early on. Anyway, whatever. Yeah. Um, oh, that was garbage. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> that didn't exist. Yeah. I, when we first started out, like, the radio uh, mechanic was very different. And as we've gotten sort of the dialogue system online, uh, we've moved more and more towards letting that always be conversations, letting that always be sort of player-driven. Originally, it was a lot more like her calling you kind of stuff. So we have had some cases where systems came online that changed the mechanics. 
that changed the narrative content. Yeah, and like, what stops Henry from sounding like an interested five-year-old who's just like, there's a cup here, there's a, another cup. You know, like, <laughs> you gotta like, yeah. figure out where the balance of that stuff lies. Yeah, there, that know? stuff's really challenging. Dude. But I've also, like, we're iterating on that radio mechanic, too. Yeah. Like, Will built out a, um, a prototype, I don't know, like, ten days ago, maybe, two weeks ago, that we knew wasn't gonna be here, but it's just allows you to, like, talk about spaces without having to talk about specific things, but isn't, um, but like if I'm like in this room and I want to talk about, oh, I'm in this room with all these great people, I can talk about that, but if I look at this cup, I could say, oh, I want to talk about this cup like the five-year-old. Uh, and that's a, it was a system that came on because we were trying to solve a problem of like, man, I'm in a cool place, but I don't have a thing to talk about, and I just wanted to start this conversation with Delilah. Um, so we built that, and that's going to get integrated into the system. So this stuff, that dialogue system will be very iterative, and I think the controls will be too. Right now, yeah. you use like the shift key to like bring up the radio and talk about something. I don't know if we'll keep that or yeah, not. Yeah, that's but. that stuff's been gone has gone back and forth more than anything else. It's just yeah, like yeah. input, which makes sense because especially in the first few months of development, when the only people playing are the, are the developers, it's all second nature because you thought of it and like implemented it, and obviously this is how this works. And then you show it to someone else, and they're just like, "How the fuck do I use my radio?" And you're like, <laughs> "It's shift still." <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's like that. That has been the thing that has probably been iterated most on the design side, but. An interesting thing too about the radio to me is how much the like choosing the content that is appropriate for the radio is also like fully defining what the design of it is because if you like to what Jake was saying about there's a cup here, there's another cup here, and like what Will was saying actually, and, and what Will was saying, like that the aggregate choices made by us and like Sean especially about what content can be reflected via the radio ends up defining what the radio actually is. Like, if the player learns after like 40 different things that they can say on the radio, that the radio is about minutia. Like, that defines then right, whereas like, maybe what the radio like, is about. Just holding something in your hand and looking at it, if that tells you enough information that you don't feel obligated to phone in about everything, that right. maybe makes it mean yeah. something different. We're sort exactly. of trying to figure out the balance of how we that cut sort of That's all, a really hard problem. Yeah, we cut a lot of that dialogue. I wrote a lot of early stuff that was like, I mean, the beer can. It, I kind of like regressed into like like Guybrush three point. Yeah, basically. like or like yeah, like pre, like when I was working on pure adventure games, I regressed into be like, there's a thing here. I have a funny thing to say about everything, and it was just like the worst. <laughs> it was so <laughs> bad because like the art's beautiful and it tells the story itself, and the thing you're thinking is probably better than what I could write. So uh, we just took a lot of that stuff out, which really helped. Um, and I wanted to say one other thing. Oh, and I th we were a little I th just in terms of demo. There's long, not long, but extensive personal conversations with Delilah where you're like, she says something about her life and you're like, oh, that's really bad. That's, that's sorry, I'm sorry to hear that. Like, oh, that's really fucked up. Like, why did you do that? You know, were you, the same things that happen when you're getting to know somebody one-on-one -on -one in isolation, like if you've ever gone to camp or just sat next to somebody on an airplane for eight hours, you know, you start to like break through the, the pleasantries. Uh, we, we were worried about showing really, at least I was worried about showing these really long conversations in front of a room, but I kind of wish I had now a little bit, you know what I mean? Like I feel like, especially the one that we cut short, but um, those are a lot of the, were a lot of the time-based sort of, oh, if I don't answer right now, I could, even if I answer after 15 seconds, she's gonna be like, well, that took you a while to yeah, answer. Yeah, that says you so know. much unto itself. Yeah, there's, so a lot of that stuff really impacts the relationship as opposed to the minutia of the objects that you're finding. And I get to that point, if, you, if she brings something up to talk about and you're in the middle of doing something else, you can just let it hang yeah. and the game doesn't force you. Like I was always, whenever the dialogue choices or whenever I was choosing to speak about something was coming up in the demo, that's because I chose to bring the radio up and, and respond to her. Um, so you know, you don't have to, but that, but she, that is, she that will at be some a point later to, might yeah. be like, uh, I was trying to bring up something kind of, like, kind of yeah, real, and, then, and you, you know, yeah. you're like, well, I was dicking around throwing this book on a log. You know, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was stacking beer cans over in the corner. Um, <laughs> I can't wait to watch you play the final game. Because <laughs> <laughs> play so differently. I'm like, I'm going out into this cave. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to stack beer cans for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thanks. thanks for the question. Thanks. Thanks. Yes, you said you were from Wyoming, but besides from being there, what made you guys choose? So Nels. It's not just yeah. me. Sorry. I don't know why I said that, <laughs> like, defensively. Like, Nels is from there, too. just me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, but um, what made you guys choose? that as your setting? Did it just seem like a natural fit to the story, or was it just something simple? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the like, social facts of where, the, of where these towers exist. Um, but at the same time, you could have put it in like, 
Arizona or New Mexico, which New, Arizona, like New Mexico still has like the broadest community of, of fire lookout towers in the country. Like it's uh, like in the Yucca National Forest still has, they and use them the most there. There's a bunch like in Glacier in Montana too. So I, I mean the Wyoming decision was probably pretty just selfish or personal I should say. Yeah. Not selfish. <laughs> it, was pretty, it, yeah. it, it was a middle of nowhere that had fire lookout towers that Two people out of ten, on like a fifth yeah. of our team, actually lived there and has been out there and knows it. So like, it's, yeah. we have a ton of specific reference about it. Like, Sean can write dialogue that's literally just like about a pizza place in Cody, Wyoming, and it's real. Like, that's actually really it's it's cool detail to be able to draw on. Yeah, I mean, probably not gonna get another chance to write a game set in the place where I grew up. So I'm like, oh, well, do it now. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> and it's pretty out there. I don't know. It looks cool. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's also like the most amazing place in the world. So. That helps. In <laughs> the greatest country in the world, too, right? <laughs> right? Says international team of. <laughs> yeah, I disagree. <laughs> Thank you for the Thank question. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Hi. So there's obviously a lot of um, similarities to the dialogue system in The Walking Dead. Uh, and I was wondering uh, with the character of Henry. Um, is he more of a directly authored character like Lee is, or is he more of a blank slate like a Commander Shepard? And if it's the former, how would you describe the character? Yeah, it's definitely um, more of a authored character. And so, uh, you know what, I was not going to save this, but I think I'll just say what you do. Should I just talk about the beginning? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, okay, well, Jake says no. no. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but you, you get to know his life in a, through gameplay, I'll say that much. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's safe to say we, we'd like to give you a little more of a handle on on who Henry is, but he's still a very specific authored person. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. the way that we often think about this, I don't know, you correct me if I'm utterly wrong, know. but You'll like be right. the, <laughs> so Henry, Henry is like a, a particular person, but like any one person has different like aspects of themselves, obviously. And when you see the choices of, for example, how you can respond to Delilah about a particular thing, like those choices ideally will reflect the different, like, the range that exists within that guy's head. And so it's not so much that you're like creating Henry, it's that you are like guiding this particular Henry and like reflecting the parts of his personality that either strike you or that seem like authentic in a given moment or what have you. Yeah, and so like by the end of the game, hopefully you can talk to someone else and talk about like what your Henry did, but like it's going to be essentially one character but you're going to see maybe slightly Yeah, he's not going to get like, I mean, like this is the example we always use, I guess, but he's not like going to get all veiny or something if you play right. the game yeah. a particular way. He's not going to grow horns. And yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, he might. Thank, Thank you very much. much. <laughs> I don't think so. It's the real mystery. Yeah. Hello? Hi. Uh, do you think that this game or this type of game, uh, first person type narrative type, would appeal to a wider audience uh, than gamers? And if so, would it make sense to try other platforms like tablet? And if you did, uh, would you sacrifice some core game mechanics to get it on there? It's possible. I think yes. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I think the game create like at its the creative content level outside of its like mechanics is just is about people. It doesn't have anything. You know, it'll it'll it appeal to I think a, a wide like specific people in a wider audience and just being like, oh, this is where our audience is, you know, like, oh, we know that everybody's going to play this game, you know, is a Steam user and has, you know, whatever. Like, the platforms right now are just a byproduct of we're nine, ten people, you know, and we have a limited budget, so we're saying we know where we can make the game, we know where we can sell it. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I think, I, I, I know both ourselves and Panic, Panic is a um, software company from Portland who's actually funding the project really interested about maybe possibly doing something on tablet. We're not building it that way. We'd have to do yeah. a lot of work. But I'm like sure. I mean this is like Our this programmers is, will and Paolo. Yeah, Will's heart rate just went up. I mean that. so it's not something we it's not something we're taking into consideration in development, but it's something that I can say yeah. like, yeah, I think you could find an audience there for this. And that kind of thing will yeah. it'll depend on how this is received, right? Like yeah. what if nobody likes it on PC? Mm, well then <laughs> maybe just quietly move on. Dump any penny we have left into the guaranteed success of an <laughs> iOS port. <laughs> we are trying to avoid any development decisions that mean we could never ever put it on tablet. Like, you know, we're, yeah, we're trying, to, trying like, to keep the controls simple and um, set them up in a way that it would be possible to swap out for Sure. Uh, a different control methodology. Um, but from a design, done, but, but from a design standpoint, we're 
when we make those decisions that are currently really being made for like mouse and keyboard or a controller. Yeah. yeah. Like we are, it is, this is a like, you know. We don't not make a decision about the creative quality of the game or the game, or the, just the, experience, the quality of the experience based on the fact that we want it to go really broad. It's like, oh, this would make the game 2% worse, but we could sell it over here too. It's like, we don't really do that. That said though, since the game is set in 1989, we will be offering a PDF of an optional keyboard overlay, like flight sim style. <laughs> <laughs> you need to write that down like right now. We need to totally do that. It's on the record. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, hopefully that helps answer your question. Great, thanks. No, thank you. Thank you. Cool. Uh, oh, hello. Hi. Um, so from um, knowing a little bit about some of the people that are in your group and having listened to a lot of Idle Thumbs, I thought there might be, I thought the, the game that you might make would have a lot of kind of emergent gameplay and systems interacting Oops. with each other, you know, Spelunky, Far Cry 2, this kind of stuff. Uh, did you try and get any of that into the game earlier on and did you have to cut it or was it never even part of the plan? I would say it's been the opposite of that. I would say some of that stuff has started to emerge from watching people play the game and see what they're, what they actually try to do that we didn't anticipate and then try and like reflect or kind of reward that in ways that are interesting. But yeah, this is not a sadly Far Cry 2 style, you know, <laughs> like just extravagant bonanza of emergent systems colliding, so. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is because we set out to make, to tell a personal story about a specific character and then, you know, you had it, you, all that stuff kind of will fall into the back. It's, just, it's impossible to like once, you know, a grenade rolls down a hill and it ignites a forest fire that then, that then, that then, that then, and meanwhile you're like talking about, you know, you know, yeah. like your, your afternoon the day before, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. it's, it's, there's a dissonance there. But at the same, it's, it's something I just realized what Chris was talking about, it being the opposite, is that, like in the demo, Jake throws that boombox into the lake, like, that wasn't the design of the game, that was somebody saying like, oh, it would be funny if you just got pissed at them and threw their boombox in the lake, and now it's the game. <laughs> like, so like that stuff is definitely... It's like when we were having early conversations with Nell, we were like, can we pick stuff up? Can we throw stuff? Okay, we've got these kids with this boombox, that means you can pick up the radio, you can throw it, and they're at a lake, which means there's a lake, which means you can pick up the boombox, throw it in the lake, and they're still there seeing you do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. that's now the, in the game. Like, yeah, I mean, the, the game is built pretty systemically in that sense. It's like boombox object, boom object collides with receiving object, whatever, creates a state. Do we respond to that with explicit content or not? Yeah. Um, it's very, like, we're using Unity, uh, as you can see by a little executable sign, probably. And, you know, like, we ha everything has a physics module. Everything just, like, we have, we get a lot of stuff for free in that sense, so it'd be silly to not respond to player action. Yeah, so hopefully, you, yeah. you got to make a call on a case by case. Like the when Jake stamped out the campfire, that was another thing that was not in the design at all. And just when people play tested the game, they yeah. thought that should be something they're able to do. And like pick up the beer cans, Jake ch chose to declare himself not to be the maid. But like you could also <laughs> take them and collect them and put them in your backpack. And you then, can pick all of them up. And yeah, like, and okay, the, the, all that yeah. stuff. Like that didn't even occur to us early on. It was someone was playing the well, game. Like, I'm like a ranger, right? Shouldn't I be able yeah, to like, clean up Yeah, like, shouldn't I be able to, like, clean up and, like, put out the fire and do this shit? And, like, oh, oh right, maybe yeah. that's entirely appropriate. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> so, you forget, we though. We just love like, the game totally where you can make forget. a mess. It's yeah. like, and then it's so, you see somebody, you know, like, start to play it, and you're like, oh, they're role-playing as the, th oh, they're doing the thing we set out to do. <laughs> <laughs> we forgot, because, yeah. And so it just becomes a, like, yeah, we, we just are. make a call. I'm like, all right, well, James then can, like, animate some stamping out and like I hooked up some sounds to it. Yeah, and we already had, since you like, could confiscate the fireworks and you could steal the booze, we're like, oh, we'll just tag all these other objects as just, you can put them away, done, yeah. like, done. Yeah. Like, we're definitely finding the game is, like, in the office very jiffable, which I think means the systems are working. Like, somebody brought, so in the, there are those books that Jake was tossing around. Um, one of them is um, a book from a friend's video game. Um, I don't know if you saw it, but somebody brought that book down to the campfire and threw it in the fire and then stomped on it. <laughs> and it looked great. It looked like like it looked, like, it looked like triple it A game content. It looked yeah. awesome. It looked like we it built it like that way. It looked like Duke Nukem was crushing the hell out of it. Yeah. <laughs> so that was gift and sent in an IM to that person. <laughs> you know, so hopefully that stuff happened and a bunch of more and more probably. and more. And it's like it's you know, it's like a, it's a snowball. Like that stuff you put more and more and more stuff into the game and then you get these collisions and yeah. then as long as those don't break the story we, we, we're gonna go forward. So hopefully there's a lot of those as we yeah. Like that antler that Jake put up. Thanks. I just made it so that you could decorate your outhouse with it. 
Oh, it has put back in the outhouse? I didn't yeah. know that. What does? Yeah. You can put the antler in the outhouse, which is weird. Oh, yeah, if you think about it, there's just two nails in the outhouse now that you yeah, can hang you on could, if you want. Though. That's probably where it was before. Some oh, that's so good. Oh, yeah, like stuff like that. It's you guys, fun to that's do. nice. <laughs> All right, maybe just. But, like, those conversations actually are like a window into where we are in development, which is like basically Will has killed himself to make sure we have like all the, those types of systems that work. So, Jane can just take a thing, apply a, like some properties to it that Will has built in code, and then. Like, it's I wouldn't want to do it, so I'll let Yeah. It's, it's, it's that, and then it. on the other side, Paolo, uh, who's doing all of our graphics work, has been working with. Jane and with Ollie and with some off the store Unity stuff. The Unity asset store is amazing if you're doing Incredible. Unity dev. Yeah. Yeah. But that plus a bunch of handwritten stuff to give us this crazy set of environmental and atmospheric tools so we can take a thing that looks just kind of like a Unity game that you look at and go, ah, oh, it's a Unity game. Uh, no, I mean, no offense to the default Unity lighting model, but whatever. Uh, and then just lay in all this crazy stuff. So, like, I don't know, the last few weeks. For like have been almost crazy. no money, it's a preposterous. Yeah. Yeah. You can get you can things that do like modules. Inc for, yeah. Incredible post processing effects and stuff for like 20 bucks on the Unity Asset Store. It's amazing. If you're making a Unity game, like, use that stuff. We'll blog about that stuff too, yeah, about the exact sure. things we're using. Yeah. I can tell you right now, it's like, we're using a thing called Sector that was made by Nathan Martz, who's mm -hmm. an ex Double Fine guy. Uh, and we're using uh, Amplify Marmoset Sky Shop and Amplify Color. Yeah, Amplify Color for color. And there's some other weird stuff. Remember well, when I installed Unity Lock and broke the game? Yeah. Anyway. yeah. And then so a bunch of that. crazy stuff to do weird Ollie style stuff, which yeah. you'll see in the trailer even more than in the game. Yeah. Um, so I don't remember which side we're on. I guess we take these last questions yeah, last for two. the trailer, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, Hi. Looking through all of the art and stuff since it's been announced, I somehow got the impression that this was going to be a third-person game. So I'm wondering why you decided to pick first-person as opposed to third-person or even traditional point-and-click adventure, since that's something you've done. really expensive to make a third-person game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's yep. incredible. Having, having a guy do all the things on screen that we want you to do in this game is expensive because your expectation. Once you see a guy like throw a rope off of a tide in Carabiner and climb down it in a responsive way, you're like, this is not Nathan Drake, therefore it's bad. Like, and we're not going to hit Nathan Drake. Also, there's a lot to be said for we're not going to hit Nathan Drake. <laughs> not what I mean. Um, if you see anybody in Nathan Drake cosplay, <laughs> send them. Uh, no. Campo Santo. Also, <laughs> there's, just, hurt them, there's just a lot of really fun, expressive things you can do in first person. You can get down into the details of just like just where you choose to look means something in first person in a way that like swinging the camera around means something like cinematic in a third person game. Like, you get a cool framing of like Nathan Drake and Nepal in the background. Whereas in a first person game, if someone's like, holy crap, look over there, you just go and you're looking over there and it's done. And like th that there's meaning in very tiny movement. And that, that goes all the way down to like some of the like climbing stuff and the stuff with the lockbox that you were seeing. Um, I also think this is maybe like a slightly indulgent thing to say, but like, I think Go that on. I, th <laughs> I think that there's like a big difference between your relationship with the character in a third-person game like Uncharted and in a first-person game like this. In Uncharted, Nathan Drake is like, you're playing as him, but he's also kind of your affable buddy. And the fact that he's on screen all the time, you're like hanging out with him, and he's like quipping, and like it's fun, and he's got cool animations, and he's like a guy that you're in the space with. In this game. You're alone. Like you're in the middle of the forest. You're isolated. Your only means of communication is like this radio There's to this woman you, hand, who you can't yeah. even see. Um, like if our guy was there, like being expressive and cool in the middle of the screen, I think it would possibly lessen the like thematic kind of resonance of you are alone, surrounded by the wilderness. Like you want to see the trees like dwarfing you. You know, you don't want because in third person you're pulled back. The scale of everything gets shrunk and like every you know things start to approximate each other in relative scale in this case like you see how you feel how small you are compared to all this shit out in the world sorry um, and I think that that just helps you kind of like sink into the overall ambiance in the world and like the sensation of solitude so that's what I think James is also a badass animator, oh, and you get to see all his fucking hands. <laughs> yeah, if you want to, I mean, you'll see a bunch of James' stuff in the trailer, but if you want to see crazy first-person animation, you should do a search on YouTube for James Benson Half-Life trailer. Yeah. <laughs> he took all the stuff from Half-Life 1, like all the 1998 assets, and re-rigged them so that it's all like Gordon has full body awareness and like crazy, like, his glasses. This is how we off. met James, by the yeah. way. <laughs> we saw this trailer, like, years ago, and we're like, this guy is awesome. Uh, and then he went and made Ori, which is fine. 
Yeah. No, no. <laughs> it's fine that he did that. It's the fine that he did is, that. The game, the game is very yeah. fine. I, I don't know how clear it was um, in the, the demo, but the trailer would be a lot more explicit about how much uh, body awareness stuff there is. So you saw a little bit with the lockbox, but um, basically, you know, any action you're uh, undertaking is, is fully represented, and you have, you know, um, if you're going into a prescribed animation of I'm clipping something in, you can still move your camera around, and if you want to look down at your legs whilst you're hopping over the log, you can see all that stuff. And that's all part of, um, you know, not having Henry just be kind of faceless cipher like first person. Orbit, yeah. yeah, exactly. He's not floating camera with like gun here. Um, so, you know, we're also trying to get across, you know, in development, um, whenever there's an action of Henry climbs the thing, there's a battle a little bit between making a nice responsive uh, mechanic, but then also trying to get across all the character stuff. And that's essentially like the main part of my job is to say, this isn't just like cool guy, first person shooter dude, but he's um, a real character and expressing a lot of that in the animation. And that's why we're doing all of the enormous amount of work, which is for the full body awareness stuff. So yeah. It's also yeah. fun because we're drawing the body when people play the game or see it played for the first time and look down and like, yeah, guy's kind of like a punchy guy. It's like, yes, he yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll do one more. Last question, question I guess? Yes. We'll also be wherever we're allowed yeah, to be you if you guys want to talk to us after Yeah, you questions this. after this. So there's a lot of focus on player choices. Is it possible for the player to make bad choices? Is there any considerations made towards a fail state? Um, you can make bad choices if you think they're bad choices. Yeah, no, there's not, not really. Um, yeah, it was funny. I really, like, I'm going to go back to my like, telltale time. Uh, really early on, on the Walking Dead game, uh, this programmer, Carl, who's awesome, uh, he runs uh, Baff's Guide to Interactive Fiction. He's a cool dude. But I remember him saying to me, yeah, it's a, he's like, I like a game, he's like, this game could be a game like, this is really early, where like, you don't really have to have a strategy, you just have to do something. And I really liked that. And I really, like, like your strategy is do something. And like, I really thought that was like really, he said that and I obviously didn't forget it because I'm talking about it now. Uh, and that's it, you know. I think, I don't think bad choices or like wrong choices are particularly interesting in a game. And it's really refreshing to be able to just express your opinion, even if it's like the marginal one in a list in the game, and have the game go, oh, okay, or like, yeah, I think that too, or whatever. But you, but you can still make a choice that, like, you regret. Like, you can oh, of make, course. Like, there's yeah. a difference between like bad choice as failure state gameplay wise, right. and bad choice as like. Fuck! I said this thing because it seemed like a funny thing to say, but in retrospect, that was a fucking shitty thing to say to Delilah or something. Yeah. And now I see that as a bad choice because I'm a human and I can empathize with people and like. Yeah, it's not a great day simulator. Yeah, like you're not gonna get. There's not like points for like good choice, bad choice. It's more like they are choices good. that yeah. you're making. Super good. Yeah. yeah. That's a really good way of putting it. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Thanks. Thank right, you. We should show our trailer now. Yeah, you guys want to see some stuff? Out of time. Yeah. Yeah.